Okay, I think you, I think that's the signal, Linda. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Spink, an Amherst Stabers board member, and I'd like to welcome you to today's session on the future of housing in Amherst. It's wonderful to have so many of us here today for this very timely and important topic. And I'm excited about a very lively discussion that I'm sure will ensue after our comments from our speakers. Some of you I know are members of Amherst Neighbors, but for those who aren't, I'd like to share a bit about us. Amherst Neighbors is a member-led, no-fee, nonprofit organization that helps to build neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor connections and offers volunteer services and programs to adult, older adults who wish to live their lives independent and socially engaged within their communities. Any adult living in Amherst or Pelham is welcome to join as a member, as a volunteer, or both. We've found that sometimes a helping hand is all someone needs to live independently. So members who are 55 and older can request services that make life a bit easier, such as rides to appointments, curbside pickups for groceries, friendly visits, in-house chores, and even some light gardening are examples of how we can provide that little assistance to make life a bit easier. We also provide programs much like this one that entertain and educate and connect members to members. Um, that's through like say our monthly coffee chats and gatherings, our annual picnics and social gatherings. We have a first Thursday speaker series. Today is the third of that such series. Um, we have interest groups for people who are wanting to hike and bike or see movies and talk about them. And we have much more. To date, most of our, our events have been virtual, um, but we'll be developing more in-person events as we can. All of us, we know that all of us could use good referrals for reliable contractors. And so we provide to our members access to a list of member recommended service providers for such tasks as landscaping help or yard work or snow shoveling, or even professional services such as legal assistance and healthcare providers. Something that allows you to make informed choices about people you might need to help you outside of the general assistance that we could provide. And we have a listserv now where members can share information and resources directly with each other. Again, ways to communicate, stay connected and build those connections over time through helping each other. I invite you to check out our website for a listing of upcoming events and consider becoming a member of Amherst Neighbors and be part of your community in this way. In the chat, you'll find a document that provides more details and has a link to our website. So please check that out when you, now or after the session. Speaking of the chat, um, if you'd like to receive handouts and resources from today's sessions, please put your name or type your name into the, and email into the chat itself. We'll get the information back to you after the sessions, over. I can assure you that the information you put into that will not be shared with others. So feel free to put your name and email in the chat. We are especially excited today to be presenting today's session with our co-sponsors, the Town of Amherst, the League of Women Voters of Amherst, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and the Amherst Affordable Housing Advocacy Coalition. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank all of them for helping to make this session possible and for their vital work in our communities. It's now my pleasure to introduce Linda Slakey, our moderator for this event today. She'll be introducing our speakers, guiding us through the session and taking questions as appropriate and giving us information on how you might interact with your questions. Before turning the program over to Linda, however, I'd like to share a little information about her. Currently, she's the chair of the Amherst Community Land Trust, which assists low and moderate income households in purchasing homes in Amherst. Over her career at UMass, she was chair of the Department of Biochemistry, Dean of the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics, and Dean of the Commonwealth Honors College. She now has a consulting practice working with universities on projects that support faculty in adopting teaching practices that reflect on what we know about how people learn. We're very fortunate to have her with us today and I'd like to thank her for moderating this session. And I'd like to thank all of the panelists that you'll be meeting a little bit later. So together, Linda, 
I open it to you and everybody welcome to a fabulous session. I know you're gonna learn a lot and be connected in different ways to the housing issues in Amherst. Thank you, Linda, for that kind introduction. And since you opened for us, no one introduced you. So let me rectify that by sharing a little bit about you. I suspect the Amherst Neighbors Group already know you well, uh, but we have attendees, I think, from a number of interest groups. So um, to all of the rest of you, Linda Spink is a founding board member uh, and a mainstay of the program committee of Amherst Neighbors. And she's uh, in that heading, that committee responsible for this afternoon's program. Um, prior to her retirement, she was the executive director of the Insight Meditation Center in Barrie. So thank you for getting us started on that. So yeah, you should see on your screen now um, an agenda. Um, so you've heard, you've heard from the two Lindas, I'll stop in a minute. <laughs> you're, you're subsequently going to hear from John Hornick, uh, who's going to give an overview of uh, the status of affordable housing in Amherst. Um, Donna Hancock, who's going to speak in a more personal level about what's available uh, as uh, affordable housing, uh, especially for older adults in Amherst. Um, Jerry Weiss will be talking about specifically the housing needs of older adults who are without housing. And then we'll hear from John again, sharing with us some specific plans for an affordable housing uh, development that would focus on older adults. And then we'll welcome uh, Mary Beth Ogulowicz, uh, who'll be responding to the things that she's heard as well as sharing some of her own perspectives. And I'll introduce each one of the speakers uh, as they begin. So let me turn now to introducing John Hornick. John has held a wide range of professional positions in, uh, in higher education and state mental health over the years. Among many research projects, he led a HUD-funded study of strategies for improving homeless people's access to benefits and services. Uh, specifically relative to today's discussion, since 2016, he served on the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and he now serves as the chair of that group. So, John, we'll uh, go on to your overview of the housing situation in Amherst. Thanks very much, Linda. Um, I have a set of slides, and I'm going to try to march through them fairly quickly so that we don't... Uh, I don't take up too much time from the other speakers. Um, basically, I'm going to offer up some facts, um, some information about trends, and some thoughts about the future. Uh, so next slide, please, Nate. OK, hold on a minute. Sorry, John. I, uh, wait, how's that? OK. Um, I have two quotes here. Um, the first, this town suffers from a severe housing shortage. We want to be welcoming and livable city, but people of all ages, backgrounds, and occupations are struggling to keep or find a home here. Our adult children can't afford to live here. People who work here can't afford to move here. Seniors can't afford to stay. A combination of high land prices, restrictive zoning, an unpredictable, often lengthy permitting process and neighborhood opposition to new multifamily development is making it very hard to build the kind of housing we need. Now, somebody could have said that about Amherst, but in fact, it comes from something somebody said about the city of Newton. Uh, so this is not just an Amherst problem. This is not just the Newton problem, but many of the cities and towns in Massachusetts and elsewhere are uh, blessed or challenged by these kinds of problems. On the next slide, uh, let's see, uh, briefly, there are three main factors which I'll talk about that explain why we're in this situation. First, there have been significant population changes that create demand for housing. Second, there's a lack of housing production, so we don't have enough places to meet the demand. And finally, 
increasing the demand has been the growth of UMass enrollment over the years. So let's move to population changes. Um, this slide only goes through 2010. We wanted to go through 2020, but unfortunately the data that we needed won't be available to the end of this month. So we'll update it then, but for now, this is what we think we know. Um, the, uh, let's see, I, I left out the legend, the top line basically is the population that's 18 to 24. So that is your student population. Not everybody 18 to 24 is a student, but the majority of those people are. And you can see they are far and away the largest group in Amherst. Um, if you drop down to the bottom line, those are people, uh, I think it's over the age of 65. And what you see is a steady increase in the number of older people in our community. So um, then there are a few other things that are of interest here. Um, one is what's happening to adults who are uh, 22, uh, sorry, uh, 25 to uh, 45. I think that's the line which is the dashed uh, yellow observations, and that group's been declining. Similarly, right below them is a line in red that's dashed. That's the population of zero to 17. So basically, we have a community in which young people and families with young children have been disappearing or did dis been disappearing over the 20 years from 1990 to 2010. And uh, uh, everything indicates that that's continuing to happen. So those, those really are not positive trends for the community. Um, next slide is interesting. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to do with housing, but since the data were available, I thought I should at least comment briefly on it. The top line is the white population of the community. And you can see that in the last decade, this does include uh, the decade 2010 to 2020, the size of that population has been going down. At this point, about 75% of the population of Amherst is classified as white. Um, and the other non-white or minority populations have been rising, including at the very bottom, a small number of people who are of mixed uh, racial and ethnic origin. So Amherst is changing to become a more diverse community. It's interesting that speaks for Amherst, but if you look at similar data for the communities that immediately surround us, uh, those populations remain large, largely white. You're talking about 80 to 90% of their residents being white and not a lot of new uh, population influx from other people. Okay, moving along. So we, we're getting a look at population changes. Uh, I mentioned that there hasn't been a lot of housing production. Um, if you look at this slide, you'll see from a period from 1970 to 79, uh, and even the 10 years earlier, there was a huge amount of housing production in Amherst. That represents the growth of the university. A lot of this was housing uh, in order to meet the needs of new faculty and staff who were being hired during this period. So there was huge growth there in a number of parts of town. Then you see that growth really drops down significantly in the following 10 years and continue to drop down so that between the years 2000 and 2009, the slide shows only 200, I think it's 27, I'm not sure, new houses over that 10 years. It's a little over 20 new units a year and then finally, um, in the last 10 years, 
we've had some growth in housing, a little over a thousand. And in the past year, 2020, we had another 242 units. Um, what's the significance of this? Basically, while demand was increasing in the community um, because of population changes, overall demand, um, housing production simply wasn't keeping up. And so anything we've built in the last 10 years or build next year or the year after is really an effort to keep up. And we need to do much more than we've been doing uh, in order to manage that. Uh, next slide. Uh, university residential planning. You can't talk about housing in Amherst without talking about housing at the university. The university now has an enrollment of roughly 28,000. That doesn't include various off-campus programs would add a few thousand more students. On campus, the university has roughly 14,000 residential unit. So the difference is about 14,000. That means that you have about 14,000 every year who are looking for housing off campus. And it's important to say that in many cases, it's not just an individual student looking for housing, but it could be students and family members since there are a fair number of students who come to Amherst with their families. The university has some announced plans uh, to replace some existing housing and to build a little bit at the same time. But the truth is the actual number of new units is net about 400. So there's honestly very little going on at the university and this is where their plans stand today. And mostly the announced plans are stuff that frankly they have yet to break ground on, never mind thinking about something else. Next slide. Um, I, the university is extraordinarily important. We think of the university as an academic institution. Of course, that's what it is. But it's also the largest landlord in Amherst. If they've got 14,000 units on campus, that makes them far and away the biggest provider of housing, certainly in Amherst and probably in the Connecticut River Valley, or at least north of Hartford and Springfield. Um, and so as student enrollment increases and it outstrips the demand for housing on campus, people move off campus. And so we have a huge impact, economic impact on the housing market in Amherst and beyond. This creates problems not only for students, but for people who work for the university, people who work for the town and people who work for local businesses because they can't find a place to live that is near where they work or where they go to school. Next slide. Um, so briefly, older residents in Amherst have aged out of child raising. Remember all those units, maybe 2000 that were built um, from 1970 to 1980. Um, those people are still there they remain a significant part of the town's residential population, although many of them no, lo don't, no longer have children. The lack of housing production has been a big problem, although it picked up in the last few years. And finally, overall university enrollment or growth has significantly outpaced on-campus residential growth since 2000. So moving along, one way to think about this that I like is uh, remembering my ch a childhood a game we used to play called musical chairs. And I'm sure almost everybody remembers this game. Essentially, um, the players walk around a set of chairs while the music is going on. And when the music stops, everybody has to get into a chair. And with each round, a chair is taken away. Uh, but, uh, and also people who can't find a share are taken away until finally you're left with one or two players at the end. What you have in Amherst now 
is adding players to this game, but not adding chairs. And so musical chairs is not fun for people who need housing in this community. Okay, going further, next, look a little bit more at the consequences. A lot of these consequences are individual. The Amity, Amity, sorry, <clears throat> the Amherst Community Land Trust, of which Linda Slakey is the chair, assists low-income first-time home buyers in purchasing a home. Um, generally, they're trying to find things at the lower end of the market. Um, this year, one family was able to find a place for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but then a second family that they were working with was outbid on a number of properties. They couldn't find a place at that same value or even a little bit higher value. So like the cost of rental units, which we'll come to in a minute, the costs of homes are also rising in what has become a seller's market. You have entrepreneurs who for years have been buying up homes to rent to students so that they go off the market for say new families and there are also now people moving to Amherst from urban areas as a result of the pandemic. So the market is pretty tough uh, and getting more and more difficult. If we look at the next slide, um, one of the consequences, which I briefly alluded to earlier, is that there are fewer families with children. Here are some stories. This is one, and there are others we'll come to. Um, that people have told me. I met a man who was a single parent who worked for the town of Amherst and for many years he lived with his son in a brick house. The rent didn't increase too much until now probably three years ago. It reached a point where it was no longer affordable on his salary and he and his son had to move out of Amherst. The good news is his son had completed the Amherst schools at that point but nonetheless if they he hadn't, they still would have had to go someplace else. Um, and what we're seeing in the data is that the numbers of families with school-aged children are declining. Um, we've dropped close to 700 students, uh, sorry, 700 families with children. And uh, other data tells us that the number of school-aged children residing in Amherst has dropped by more than 1,000. Next slide. Um, I met a woman who was a new PhD. Actually, this is now two years ago. She came from another state on a research fellowship and she was unable to find housing in Amherst. So what did she do? Her parents live in Massachusetts, not close to Amherst, but close enough, so to speak. So she decided to move in with them to move back to the family home, even though she was 45 minutes away um, from Amherst. Uh, Nick Grabby just did an informal survey. He has a unit in his house that he rents out to student, and he had a lot of people asking if they could rent. So he had information about each of these people. He had, a, uh, had their emails, and he asked he followed up with a fair number of one to find out what they, where they found housing. And they found housing as far away as Field, Springfield. So we've got a significant problem. Another way in which this problem manifests itself is in housing insecurity. Um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, the uh, US Census identifies or defines cost burden as a family that spends more than 30% of their income on housing and severely cost burden if the household spends more than 50% of its income on housing. <clears throat> so that's pretty burdening. If we go up and look at what's happening for renters in Amherst, 20% of households are cost burdened and 40% are severely cost burdened. I may have reversed those two. It may be 40 are cost burden and 20% are severely cost burden. Sorry about that. And for homeowners, we have less of a problem. Homeowners are better off in Amherst. And so there are fewer that are cost burden, but it's still a bit of a problem. 
So moving on um, with the pandemic, there's a lot of concern about foreclosures and evictions. And I just wanted to summarize a little bit of the information that's known now for our area in Hampshire County and Western Mass. I also wanted to note that there's state legislation pending that would try to reduce the risk of foreclosure and eviction. As you all may know, uh, the state had a, a, an eviction uh, stoppage that was a moratorium, I should say, that was lifted last October. And then the CDC had a less expansive moratorium, but nonetheless, one that was important that was lifted, uh, I believe, in May and then reinstated and now again canceled by the Supreme Court. So lots of people are at risk of being forced out of their homes. Okay, so let's see, we're waiting for the next slide. Um, and I wanted to talk about the future. Uh, I didn't have to go to Greece to the Oracle of Delphi to figure out what the future is. Frankly, the future is our past. Um, and so if you're a student in Amherst, developers will continue to build high rent apartments, um, but there's not gonna be much growth on campus, despite the fact there is interest and demand there. If you already own your own home, your neighborhood uh, may see more student rentals. I know that's true for my neighborhood of about 25 or 20, 25 homes now. Um, about nine of them are now student rentals. If you're a family with school-age children, opportunities to become a homeowner or a renter at an affordable cost will continue to be slim. If you're an older adult living in Amherst and want to downsize, new opportunities to find an affordable place uh, that would allow you to stay in the Amherst community may not materialize. If you're a low-income renter, your rent will probably increase, making your housing more insecure, while the quality of your housing may also diminish. So honestly, this is our future, unless the university and town council find a way to make major changes, I can't be optimistic about what's happening. <clears throat> Let me move on and, and talk a little bit about some of the efforts that people have made. Uh, so I think that's important. Uh, there is a thing called the subsidized housing inventory, which keeps track of all the housing that is quote unquote affordable um, mostly because it's subsidized by one source of income or another. Um, the town has tried to engage the community to support the expansion of affordable housing. There are some dedicated resources within town government. We continue to work to find uh, ways to increase it. The most significant local change was the updating of a, what's called the inclusionary bylaw to require construction of affordable homes and all new developments greater than nine units. And I should say over 1 million in CPA funds has been spent on community housing in the past five years. So there are things happening, but quite honestly, it's not enough. Uh, let me mention a couple of other things, or at least briefly show you the slide which shows them. These are four key projects. Uh, that have occurred. Um, people are probably familiar with North Square. That's the most recent. Um, it includes 26 affordable units out of something like 128 total units. Habitat of Humanity has created five recent homes uh, for home ownership for low-income families. Um, probably the most recent was now a couple of years ago. The town has a first time home buyers program, which is run by Valley Community Development and the Amherst Community Land Trust. And I think that's affected um, something like 14 house, households over the last five or six years. And uh, Rolling Green, which is shown in the slide, 
the town preserved as affordable 42 of the units that were there um, when it assisted with the uh, kind of purchase of the property by Beacon Communities from uh, a real estate group that owned it before. So some things are happening. Um, we look at the fact that the town council or the community resources committee is working on a new town housing policy. Uh, that will briefly summarized in the next slide. Uh, I don't, I wanna, I don't wanna read these, but basically there are five major goals that are interdependent that the community resources committee has said we need to move toward in order to improve housing for really all populations within the town. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over those, but I will go to the next slide to talk about some of the specific things that they proposed as part of the policy and things that would get attention in terms of measuring pro progress. A minimum of 250 new units for households earning less than 80% of area median income, reducing the percentage of renters who are cost burdened and severely cost burden by 50%, reducing uh, percentage of owners who are similarly cost burdened and reducing the number of ho homeless individuals who are served at Craig's doors because they become housed. Uh, so we've put in the chat actually a link to the new draft policy. It's continued to be draft. CRC will work on it and then present it to town council. Uh, a little bit later this month. Um, other issues are what they call safe and secure housing, reducing the number of health and safety violations, and also, um, again, consistent with the last issue, trying to implement a year-round sheltering option in Amherst. Finally, uh, let's see. These are things that are on the drawing board. There's the Amherst Studio Apartments, which people may be familiar with. The town has drafted a request for proposals, which should be released soon, that would allow a affordable development for families at the old East Street School and a nearby property on Belchertown Road. We hope to see a home ownership development on Strong Street and uh, additional funding come through for helping to retrofit heating systems and weatherization in low-income rental developments. Uh, and, and also potentially the purchase of the University Motor Lodge and new subsidies for home ownership. And finally, as we'll talk about a little bit later, the development of a uh, rental property for older adults, potentially at Hickory Ridge. Um, I've kind of alluded to this. The next thing I wanted to say is that this is not only, oh, sorry. I think I'm gonna skip over this slide in the interest of town time, sorry, um, but go to this one. Um, this is not just an Amherst problem. The Donahue Institute recently published a report with support from Wayfinders and the Community Foundation in which they showed that the kinds of problems that I've been talking about in Amherst are problems really north and south from Springfield to Greenfield. Uh, they show an increasing housing supply gap, which is driving up prices, um, in, in continuing housing instability, and the fact that more than half of renters in the Pioneer Valley are cost burden, spending 30% or more of their income on housing. And what's also important to note is that this trend is even worse for communities of color. So the last slide, what do we need? Where do we need to go? Um, again, I've got a list of things here. They're consistent with things that I've said. 
this is to change that bleak future that I talked about earlier. We need a partner in the university that recognizes its role in the local housing market and plans to develop three to 5,000 new units on campus for its students, including those with families. For the town itself, um, consistent with what the Community Resources Committee has said, we should see at least 250 new affordable units in the next five years or so. Um, we need to make sure that these units are available to groups that need them. We need to be sure that they're not segregated or isolated, but close to services, including transportation. We need to find ways of assisting people who are looking for affordable housing in identifying and accessing available homes. And finally, we need to maintain our commitment to supporting the Amherst Seasonal Shelter, even as we develop new housing. And for all of this to happen, we need your ideas and your advocacy. So thank you all for listening. And now, Linda, I think we're ready to move on to our next speaker. Thank you. I believe that's Donna. Yes. I believe. Yes, it is. My name is Donna Hancock. And thank you, John, for allowing me to be a speaker on this panel. I was asked from, uh, I think it was Nancy Schroeder, because I am a senior and I'm living what you all are talking about. She thought it best that I could give you a personal synopsis of what I have go I've, I've gone through. Um, as being a senior, I moved here in uh, 2011 to be with my mother from Florida. Prior to that, I had a six bedroom house and I had to downsize. Working for the phone company for 21 years, I had a pretty good retirement. I got caught up in the housing bubble, bought two houses, lost both houses and lost all my money. So then I come up here to live with my mother. I had to move somewhere, but there was nothing available. Not even the housing authority could help out. Finally, staying with my mom for like a year, I ended up going to the Ann Whalen Apartments over here on Kellogg Street. And uh, I stayed there for seven years before I got a chance to move into the Clark House. That was the waiting list. That goes to show you how some of the seniors have had to wait. That was a waiting list that I got on. I moved in the Clark House in 20, uh, 2018, I believe it was. And I've been there since. But the catch is, is they uh, for affordable housing, they take a third of your income to pay for your rent to help you out. Each year that I work here for the Meals on Wheels program for my precious seniors, and I get a raise, my rent goes up and up and up. Before I started working, my rent was like 360 something. Now, because I work, it's third of my income plus my social security. I'm paying almost seven, well, I am paying $710 a month. And the more I pay, the more I wonder, am I gonna have to leave Amherst? Um, I may have to move where my kids are because I am gonna be 70. These are some of the things that plague our seniors. The strength, I think, of Amherst is that you, you do have affordable housing that is decent housing. I've seen affordable housing, if you will, for seniors that wasn't quite as nice as they are up here. I've seen some that are rat infested, roach infested, not, not nearly as good. People are clumped together. So the strength of this area is the fact that they're, they do take care of their seniors. Uh, you know, I have to give you kudos. You, I, I think it's a marvelous situation you have here. Uh, the, the, the other strengths that some of the seniors have told us is that you do have a well-rounded community who do think about the seniors. It's not a thing where, well, we know they're there, they're going to die, whatever. They know that they fit in the community, which makes Amherst a place where people want to stay. But with the housing problem like it is, they are not aware of what is being done. That's why I'm so glad I'm on this panel so I can share it with my senior friends. So the shortcomings I would say that I got from some of my seniors was that the places are very small. 
they don't have a lot of storage. Um, for people of color, they feel that they've been left out. Um, they would like to have uh, apartments like the ones that they build down here on uh, Pleasant Street for the seniors. This is like a cross communication that I'm hearing from my senior population. And I try to let them know, no, that, that's not the case. That's not the case. Well, how do you know? So I think that uh, with everything that John has covered, I would love for this information to be given to some of the seniors that live in these two areas here. I'm only familiar with these two areas because I haven't really learned Amherst as well. My choice to live in the town was because I don't have transportation, I would have to be someplace where there's buses. That's a big problem for a lot of the seniors. But for the most part, um, I think if we work together and we're able to realize we do have a senior population, I think that this would work out my only problem that I have personally is define what is affordable housing and how do seniors look forward, even though their futures may only be months or years, how do we make them feel like they are not squashed in a corner somewhere? So that's really all I, I was going to say. I just given you a personal synopsis. So you that are on this panel hear it from a senior who is living this dream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. And I apologize, you didn't get a proper introduction. I didn't realize I was muted. I started to do that and, uh, <laughs> and, and realized that you had begun to speak. So let me just tell the participants that you're the Highland Valley Elder Services Nutrition Site Director for the Bank Center, and that you coordinate food services for low and moderate income adults every weekday. And you've also been a longtime resident, as you shared with us, uh, of the Amherst Housing Authority's public housing. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And our next speaker is Jerry Weiss. Uh, Jerry's the president of the board of Craig's House, which operates at the Amherst Seasonal Shelter, as well as other services for homeless persons. And prior to his recent retirement, he was a uh, in full-time practice as a psychiatric social worker in Amherst. And he's going to share his observations of the needs of older adults who become homeless. Jerry? Hi, thank you. I'm going to start with a few uh, statistics and data about homeless homelessness. Um, nationally, according to the annual homeless assessment report to Congress, there were about 67,000 elderly individuals and they, that's age 62 or older. Interestingly, as, as I did my research, it, there isn't a standard on what's elderly. <laughs> some, some say 62, some say 65. Um, HUD seems to not even bother at, on many statistics and just say people over 24 is, is, <laughs> is a group. So it's actually hard to get these numbers. Um, but this report had 67,000 um, people 62 and older who were homeless. Um, and, that, and that was in 2016, and it was, that represented an increase of nearly 50% since 2007. And they don't see that stopping so that it's just uh, growing. It's probably the fastest growing part of the homeless population. Um, they expect that to hit hit 100,000 in the next decade. In Massachusetts, we had just under 18,000 people total experiencing homelessness on any given day in 2020, uh, with about 1,500 being chronically being considered chronically homeless. I had a lot of trouble finding the uh, the elderly number, um, so you can extrapolate. Um, this from the um, national statistics that about 9% appear to be elderly. Um, so you can do the math on that, 9% of 18,000. Um, it's a big number when you think about all those people that are 62 and, and, and older. In the past four seasons at Craig's Doors, we've given shelter to 49 people age 62 and above, which represent about 8% of our total guests. 10 of these were repeat guests, um, some all four years in that, in that uh, 
data range. This past year, there have been 15 people in that age group, which was higher than most years. Uh, I tried to get data from other Hampshire County shelters and roughly found out that there, be, there are probably about seven elders age 62 and above beyond what Craig's Doors is able to house. And of those um, 49 people that we housed in, the, in those four years, 11 were 70 or over. And we, with the oldest person being 78, we are currently serving a 78 year old person. That number has remained fairly consistent. Um, however, the number of female guests 62 and over has increased at a faster rate. And all these numbers represent people who are sheltered. It's harder to get the numbers of people who aren't sheltered. And um, in this area, two known elders have been living without any shelter for at least a year. But it's, it's a very hard one to track down. Um, so housing is, of course, the first need. Um, John has pretty much covered the, the, the affordable unit problem here. You compound that with the conditions for, for what happens when you're homeless on health, on mental health, on um, dietary needs, and it's much worse for the elderly. Uh, it's estimated that an elderly homeless person has four times higher mortality rate than their peers who are in homes. Uh, older populations, of course, struggle to manage chronic diseases without the structure of a home. Um, if anybody's been sick, you know it's nice to have a nice home to be in and a nice bed to be in. If you're very sick, it's, it's a lot harder to be in a shelter. Um, elderly people with diabetes or heart disease, it's harder for them to maintain regular doctor's appointments, met medication regimens, including proper diet. And some don't trust healthcare and don't trust social service providers. Um, and accessing public assistance programs can be daunting. Some get discouraged by the application process. Some have a hard time getting to places to receive care and some refuse help. I checked into the Amherst Housing Authority to see what, what's the process if you are elderly and homeless? Can, how do you apply for housing in Amherst? Well, you fill out an application, so you need somebody to help you get that application if you can't get it yourself. Uh, it's a fairly complicated application as Donna is shaking her head. <laughs> and if you've been homeless, you have to prove it. So you need documentation. So if you've been in a shelter, that's not hard to get. Craig's Doors could write you a letter, could write a letter saying you've been a guest here for so X number of months, for X number of years, whatever. If you've been couch surfing, they require you to get a letter from whoever you've been couch surfing with. And if you've been in the woods, there's no proof. Maybe um, agencies like Amherst Survival Center could help out then because they probably know of people who are uh, receiving food from them or clothing who are living in the woods. But that's a lot of hoops to jump through. And then <laughs> if you can jump through those hoops, you become known as emergency housing. So you think emergency housing, oh, that's gonna be quick. Nope, it's not. There is approximately a two month uh, period where they have to turn the apartment over once a unit becomes available two months to get it ready for a new person. Um, and then you have to wait for that apartment to open up. So it could take four months, it could take six months, it could take eight months, and you are considered emergency housing, even if it takes six or eight months. Not, it's not a, um, an adequate way to get emergency housing at all. And that's not the, the policy of Amherst Housing Authority, they, they said this is the state's regulations, how it has to be done. So maybe one thing should be to approach the state on their definition of emergency housing. Um, as you know, probably many older homeless individuals have difficulty with self-care, 
keeping up with hygiene, so that can cause infections, increasing, increasing their um, health needs. Uh, they, they have more, of course, more stress, social isolation, so, social isolation. Um, any mental health issues they have are gonna be exacerbated by homelessness, by the stress of it. Um, homeless seniors in urban centers have an extremely high rate of premature death. As I said, it's four times higher than the regular population. And there was one statistic I read that uh, elderly homeless people age 10 to 20 years faster than other people. So if you're 60, you, you could be aging into 70 and 80 as you remain homeless without aging there well before you get to that age. Um, services like Craig's Doors, the Senior Center, Elliott Services, Veteran Services, Amherst Survival Center, Community Connections are all trying to hook people up with their services, with medical services, with mental health services, and with housing, but it's not easy. It's, the housing is the hardest of all of those to help people with. Um, we have an increase in evictions, um, the 1980 crash, um, people lost their wealth, people became homeless, and they're aging now. Um, so one way to prevent more homelessness for elderly people is to prevent evictions, which we now know is now on an increase because of COVID. Um, state and local departments of social services often help with housing emergencies for the elderly by providing housing for low income seniors. Religious organizations help homeless seniors. Um, but as if we have um, that many people that we're, we're serving in our shelters, you know how many must be out there. So that's, I don't wanna, I don't need to talk more. I can answer questions at some point if there are. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And by the way, I've noticed a couple sets of questions coming in the chat. Uh, huh? and we're gonna proceed with the speakers just so we hear from everybody, but that hopefully is gonna leave us time at the end to come back to some of those questions. Right. Right. Um, so John, um, you get um, a chance now to tell us a little bit more about the uh, potential for an affordable housing development for older adults. Yeah. Um, if you look at the first slide, which will probably be on momentarily, it asks the question is, if we were to initiate a new rental development for older adults, what would it look like? And I'm going to suggest some answers to that question. But I think as we leave time for discussion at the end, I'm most interested in hearing what your answers are to that question. So going on to the next slide, I just... Uh, slides up, uh, there we go. Okay. Okay, here's one. That yeah. was the... Right. Okay, so someone would say, well, why are you involved in this? What's the housing trust have to do with it? Well, I didn't introduce the housing trust, but basically that's our job. We need to do what we can to promote a diversity of affordable housing in Amherst. There are a number of specific projects that we're working on that are listed here. Um, but overall, our goal is to try to get together and produce a pipeline of pro programs and projects that will make housing more affordable in Amherst. We work with the Community Preservation Act Committee and the town council. And we also seek public support, primarily through the Amherst Affordable Housing Coalition. So that's why we're involved. And that's why I'm talking about this. This is a kind of preliminary exploration of, of ideas. So as I said earlier, I'm going to suggest some things. Um, but I also want to say that there's a lot of uncertainty around this that are briefly summarized in the next slide. Um, if we do have a new rental development for older adults, I can't tell you where it would be, uh, may face various hurdles with respect to approval by town council or the town zoning board of appeals. We don't know what 
neighborhood opposition might materialize because this would likely be a sizable development. And wherever it's placed, um, we know that people will object. Uh, they say it doesn't fit in with our neighborhood. It'll add too much traffic or there's really no need for this type of housing. So we can expect to see some opposition and uh, there are various uncertainties that we need to overcome. So this is an early conversation. Um, it's an opportunity for me to suggest some things, um, but for all of us, when we come to the discussion, to share some ideas, uh, to assess what the level of interest is, uh, for you to give feedback and, uh, whoops, we're moving around quite a bit. Uh, and uh, uh, what else? To take advantage, frankly, of our collective wisdom and experience in thinking about this. And the end goal is to develop for the Housing Trust a preliminary plan to present to the town. I did a little bit of research, and so I wanted to talk a, briefly about my understanding about options for senior living. Um, and that starts on the next slide, uh, next one after that. Here we are. Uh, there are various options, and when you read about specific examples, they honestly start to blend. Uh, there are things called independent living communities. Um, there are something called assisted living residences. There are nursing homes. And then there are continuing care retirement communities, which tend to be a mix of the things above. Um, the biggest difference to me, honestly, in these different uh, groupings are whether or not healthcare is integrated that is, there are health care providers on site or part of the community. And that obviously happens in nursing homes. It also happens in communities for assisted living, but it doesn't happen with independent living. With independent living, living health care is coordinated. And as we'll see in a moment, it's something that comes on site if residents need it and get some help from the people who manage the community. Okay, moving to the next slide, I have one example of an independent living community. There's an organization called Two Life Communities. They operate largely in Eastern Massachusetts and they use what they call an aging and community model. Their goal is everybody can stay there. No one has to leave. Um, it's not labeled though as assisted living because people come in and they are independently in control of the units where they live. They have a lease, uh, they pay monthly rent, and there may be services on site, but they aren't obliged to use them. The purpose of these communities is to address economic insecurity by making the housing affordable and also address loneliness by having people live together. Um, these can be mixed, that is include subsidized as well as unsubsidized units um, and affordable to people who are dependent on social security. So it really is intended to meet the needs of a lower income group. They're mostly one bedroom and two bedroom. And if we take a look at the uh, next slide, some of the other things that are designed into two life communities, are having a ground floor that serves as a village hub. Uh, it will have a large welcoming entry. It'll have large and small rooms incorporated to support a variety of activities. And that includes encouraging visitors to come in and to use the facilities as appropriate to share them with the residents um, as allowable. So that's the two life community model. Then I wanted to mention um, another model, which will be in the next slide. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have one more slide on two life communities. As part of their design, they do have on-site staffing. 
They have a resident coordinator and an activities coordinator, typically with the goal of helping the residents to navigate the challenges of daily life. As I said, healthcare services in this model are not provided uh, by people who work for two life communities. They coordinate healthcare services. The services come to residents and the resident coordinator um, will help to bring the necessary services in partly by having agreements with outside agencies. For example, Highland Valley Elder Services in our area or the Amherst Senior Center. They also, uh, the activities coordinator arranges for activities that will be of value and of interest to residents. And those could be a wide range of things. I put in one that seems to be pretty important and that is fitness services. Okay, I have another example. And this is a senior living residence. This is an assisted living program. Uh, and uh, there's a program in Bourne on the Cape. Uh, and uh, actually there's a similar program that's in Westfield called Armbrook Village locally, if people have heard of it. Um, they aim to provide outdoor living spaces, enrich daily programs, restaurant style dining with healthy food options. So that's part of what their goals are. And then if we go to the next slide, a few more items. Um, they also, they have studios as well as one and two bedroom apartments. And again, you'd find this with two lights. There'll be a kitchen net in each unit, a shower, an emergency alert system, uh, control of heating, housekeeping and laundry services, maintenance of the apartment and utilities, and it would be wired for cable TV and phone. So many of these things you'd find in both assisted living and independent living. I, again, to me, and people can tell me if they have another understanding, the biggest interest difference has to do whether healthcare is integrated with the program. That is, there are people who are healthcare providers who are employees of the community versus depending on healthcare being brought in or coordinated as part of the program. I'll just briefly mention something about financing. Um, if we're talking about uh, independent living, there is a mix of public financing available. It may require some additional fundraising in order to pay for all services. Um, the intention is to use funding sources that assure the units will be affordable. And typically federal funding sources, depending on what source you're talking about, do carry age restrictions, either 55 and over or 62 and over. And occasionally you have different programs that are needed that may be in conflict with each other because these are a little different. Um, I know less about how financing works for communities, assisted living communities or continuing care retirement communities that have integrated healthcare. So I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, I'm not gonna speculate on how that works. So uh, two more slides. One possibility that I have thought about as a site for an independent living rental development for older adults is the Hickory Ridge Golf Course. As people know, the town has a contract to buy it. They've yet to close. Um, most of it will become town conservation land, um, but there is an area of roughly five to nine acres of developable property right along West Pomeroy Lane. So there's a place to build a good sized community for older adults. If uh, the town closes on the property and if we all agree that this property or this part of it should be made available for a community for older adults. So that's pretty much what I've got to say. I have one more slide, which you can take a look at. 
And basically the question is, what would you all like to see? And I've noted some of the things that I talked about and what I'd really like to hear is what people have to say, probably beginning with Mary Beth, who is next up. Um, Linda? Yeah, thank you, John. And I'll just briefly introduce Mary Beth Okolowitz. Uh, most recently, I think probably many of you know, knew her as the director of the Amherst Senior Center, and she's just begun a new job as chief of elders and persons with disabilities unit in the office of the uh, Northwestern District Attorney. Uh, so, uh, Mary Beth, we'll ask you to reflect on what you've heard, as well as sharing your own insights on these issues. Yeah. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with everyone in Amherst once again. And I, and I have to say that off the top of my head, that uh, looking at it from also a county point of view now, uh, the issues that you raised today are not singular and unique to Amherst, though I think some of the causative factors are very unique to Amherst. And I think that like climate change, aging uh, in Amherst really requires us to rethink how we are living and developing community. And I, and I wanna just start off with just sharing, I guess, two points of, of reference. And, and I think that they were very stark when I first arrived in Amherst. So the Donahue Institute in their projections of demographics uh, indicate that by 2030, that individuals who are age 60 and older in the town of Amherst will comprise a 30.3% increase in that population, which is a significant shift. And uh, throughout the Commonwealth, we are all discussing the graying of the state. And so I, I think that uh, this program and the focus on elders and housing, because housing is directly related to safety and well being, it is really well timed. And I really appreciate the emphasis on this topic vis a vis elders. Um, and if people are interested in looking more at that demographic information, if you go, you can find that online and I can, I can share the link with you around the Donahue Institute and the social and demographic uh, information. And more importantly, there is a breakdown of those demographics, which also shows that when we're talking about, are we looking at independent living versus uh, 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 assisted living with medical care? When you look at what portion of elderhood is going to increase the most in Amherst, it is those that are at the higher end of elderhood. So we think of elderhood as right that 40 year stage, um, and, and it's really those 85 and above. So when we're talking and looking at the needs, I think that that demographic information becomes far more relevant about what the needs are. So, uh, you know, what we call a, a young senior in the 60s is gonna have a very different idea of what they need than if you had a larger population in their 80s. So, so that's the first piece. And then the second sort of demographic piece or actually statistical information, I think is really important to this conversation is the elder index. And so the gerontology institute Institute at UMass has comprised uh, an elder index, which allows you to search by county uh, the amount of money that an individual who is an older adult needs to live securely to meet the needs uh, to live within that county. And if you look at Hampshire County, uh, it's actually uh, rather startling. And um, some of the information that I was that I was able to find that first of all that Massachusetts rates the highest in the nation in the percent of older single living alone adults with incomes below that elder index. So what it says is that 62% of older adults have an income that is less than the, what is required to live in that community. And that, you know, if we also look at the intersection of race and age, I think it plays out far more dramatically. And that three out of four black singles living alone in Massachusetts have incomes that fall below that elder index. And so what that means is that older adults have to make very difficult choices just merely to survive. So again, you know, I can put that link up there, but I think it's really important, relevant, probative information about how much money do we need and what, what in this county, um, how are we faring our older adults about trying to afford even affordable housing as, as Donna relayed that search and, and the angst that's involved. Um, and then also, um, 
uh, the folks in our community. Um, you know, again, economic insecurity is 31% higher for older Black persons who are living alone, and then 33% higher for older Black couples, and that's within the state of Massachusetts. So, so I think that the picture is is a rather stark, and I think it really speaks to an urgency that we probably haven't um, really threaded that needle quite yet. Um, and then with regard to the, the impact, what I would also suggest is that these are regional discussions. And certainly, so when we talk about homelessness, when we talk also about um, older adults needing supportive care, I'm sure Helen McMillan, who's now the director of the Amherst Senior Center can talk about the number of communities that we work with and that, that really needs to be regionally strengthened um, and resourced. And then also that this isn't just, so I noticed that probably most of us in this conversation are older folks. And, and that I, I would suggest this is, this is a family-wide and community-wide discussion because 83% of older adults who need help are cared for by their family members. So uh, older adult children who are in community, and certainly that was something that we saw at the senior center, are involved in this. During the pandemic, we received weekly calls on the, on the double um, from um, older, not older adults, but um, adult children who were moving their family members to Amherst because of the pandemic. And so this is not just a conversation for older adults, this is really a multi-generational conversation. And, and I think that there's a more robust interest uh, that we can generate around this within Amherst for that. And um, I really appreciated John's um, sort of extrapolating housing beyond um, affordable housing to looking at that conversation of long-term care and independent living in those various uh, arrangements. Because again, I'm sure uh, Helen can, can address this more than I can, but you know, with the calls that we receive in Amherst are often when somebody reaches the point where they can no longer live independently. And either the families are concerned about them or the older adults can see themselves slipping. And so we really need to sort of balance and keep that conversation going with both of those balls in the air around how can we uh, support individuals um, as their faculties and as their abilities do in fact um, diminish because that is a fact of life, right? We are all aging and, and you know, not everybody will, will age without the need for some supportive care. So um, I think that, that one of the, the interesting, I'll just leave that on a positive note. So amidst all of that, there are some, some unique um, opportunities and possibilities. And I think like the Nesterly program that runs out of Boston, I know it was featured in the New York Times a couple of uh, years ago. I had contacted them to see if they might be able to help us. And that's a shared housing um, a program where you have uh, an agency that helps to match older adults who are in their homes and, and maybe can't afford them. And it affords companionship, it gives people rental income. So in, in the instance where we're not going to have a housing stock that's going to allow people to leave, are there some interim measures that we can help to facilitate, to have safety uh, and you know, written agreements, people with, with Corey checks and um, you know, reference checks to live with older adults in a matching manner. So I think that that's a, that could be a, an interesting conversation in the meantime, while we're talking about housing, is can we come up with a housing match program? And then the last one I would I would suggest is based on my conversations with adults in Amherst, they love multi-generational. Um, and so when we're talking about senior housing, I, I know that oftentimes um, there's that sort of exceptionalism of Amherst where, where we like to be in community and, and all of that means. And I think that those are also some of the, the uh, housing opportunities that are, are mixed generation uh, can be really vibrant. So. Uh, I'm here to, to learn and listen with all of you and so hopefully support this in a countywide measure as well. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. So we have some time now before uh, we need to draw this to a close uh, for questions from the participants. Um, you can raise your hand and I made some notes of questions that are in the chat. I see um, uh, Adrian has her hand up and has had for a while. Um, Hey, um, can you unmute um, Adrian, or can she unmute herself? There, I see you. So unmute yourself, Adrian. Thank you. And what's your question? Let's 
So we're not hearing you. So Adrian, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to move to somebody else, even though it shows on the screen that you're unmuted, we're not hearing you. So maybe we, we can, can try again. Yeah, problem solve that. I'm gonna call on Lisa Campbell while you sort out what it's gonna to take to get it so we can hear Adrian. Lisa? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just am hoping everybody rattled through 109 numbers really fast. And I was trying to take notes and couldn't keep up. So is there going to be a way other than me emailing individual participants and saying, what was it you said for me to capture those numbers? Because I don't see a way at this point. You know, like how many elderly people and how old are homeless and how many, you know, what are all these various everybody did it you know so so can we ask the speakers if, if they could at least put some of those things in a form where would you like them sent john if, so if they send people? them to me then i can send them out that um, would be excellent yeah actually i, I just want to come back to another, a request we made earlier i i'd really like people to put their name and their email address in the chat if they haven't done that already so we can send out new information after this forum ends. Sure, I also, um, there's also a question earlier, and I said we could post this on the Housing Trust's webpage. So, you know, in the coming, you know, next week or so, the information uh, can, will be posted up there and it, it'll just stay there. So, um, okay. you know, you can go back to- Yeah, to it wasn't that. clear to me that every speaker would have given you something you could post, but if they did, that's great. Uh, they haven't they, yet. But if they did or if they will. Yes, <laughs> either way. Thank you. So we'll encourage them to do that. Thank you for that prompt, Alisa. Uh, Bob Greeny, I see your house, your hand up. And you need to unmute. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes, thank you. We can hear you. Hi. Um, well, I, I, what I wanted to do is expand the conversation a little bit but it, it maybe we're running out of time. So let me just throw out a few, what might be provocative um, ideas. Linda knows some of them. <laughs> um, the, the brochure says um, older adults, families, and students. So um, I, I get that we've been talking about seniors and uh, I get that that's a huge problem, and I get that we could spend forever on that. But before we leave, let's just think about, and Mary Beth kind of mentioned this in her comments about how I think those of us that are elderly and becoming more elderly um, really want mixed living situations in our senior years. And and so how, how do we create that? Not these, you know, the conventional model has its place and yet we should be thinking very broadly about some really fresh and uh, ideas for new models. But I think a lot of the things get addressed when we just address housing. And I, I'm not in a position to be articulate about this and this is not the time. But I think there are some big opportunities for really new, fresh ideas that we're just not accessing. And let me just give you one kind of interesting uh, statistic. We have 100, we have 14,000 students that need housing. Those 14,000 students are going to spend 10 to $20,000 a year just on housing, a minimum of 10,000. So that's 140 to $280 million. <laughs> Think about it, 140. So let's just say $200 million is gonna be spent on housing. Now I know it goes to Sunderland, it goes to Belgian Town, it doesn't all come to Amherst, 
but that's an Amherst resource, two to $300 million. And we should not be satisfied with skimming off the tax money. And we do get substantial tax money for that. So what I would like to talk about sometime and probably not now and get people thinking about that hundreds of million dollars is leaving Amherst because of the way the housing, most of it, especially the recent housing is being built by large corporations and funding agencies. How do we, one way in which we can keep that in town is to stimulate small scale, right? Linda, we've talked about this, growth mm -hmm. of multifamily units that are home or owned. So the profits, those huge, humongous profits that are going off to hedge funds we don't know where could be funding and supporting affordable housing by people that live in Amherst. It, I don't know how to emphasize that I think there's a potential here if we can get enough creative minds working on this for addressing in a big way, in a fresh way, our affordable housing problems and those multifamily units give the opportunity for seniors to rent where there's a family downstairs or upstairs. And of course, when you get to a healthcare situation where you need all those services, that's where Linda comes in to help those people stay in that unit as long as they possibly can. Eventually, maybe they need to go where there's more intensive care. But Anyway, I encourage people to think about the potential of what I'm suggesting. <laughs> okay, sorry, I went for a long time. Thank you for that suggestion, Bob. That certainly is a piece of economics that deserves some level of attention. Um, are there other questions? Have I missed someone who actually raised their hand or put a, a question? Oh, Ralph, you put a question in the chat. Uh, do you want to raise that with everybody? Ralph Falkingham, are you still with us? It still shows him as a participant, but I'm not hearing him respond. The, I'll just read the question that he put in the chat. How can we enjoin the university uh, to expand, I'm paraphrasing a little, to expand the amount of housing that they provide to the students? And sort of what are sort of creative ways to think about that? John, I know you've thought about that a lot. Well, that, that is a great question and maybe it's the 64,000 or $64 million question, I don't know. Um, it's really a, a political question, frankly. Um, I, I think the information that I have talked about uh, is available to the university. I don't think it's new information. Um, they simply don't think of themselves as a landlord and we have to find a way of changing that thinking. And I think that means involving our state senator, our state representative, but other people um, in, in this process of saying, really, why aren't you doing something about this? You've mm -hmm. got thousands of students that each year are looking for housing. I know some of them would like to live off campus in apartments, but there are lots who would prefer to be close to campus if they could find a decent place there to live. And it is part of your obligation to figure out how to do that. Well, that brings us, to, according to the clock on my computer, to 529. And we did agree to draw this to a close at 530. So I want to thank the speakers and also the participants who've raised all kinds of thoughtful questions. Um, and Linda, do you have any last comments you want to make as our host here? 
Well, thank you. I, I really do appreciate everyone, Linda and John and Donna and Jerry and Mary Beth for bringing such clarity and light to the challenges that we face and the obstacles that need to be overcome in order to serve the housing needs of our community. And I appreciate the, the thoughts and the creativity that's starting to bubble in this collective around how to advocate for and make materialize some of this um, housing that we need to have for elderly in particular from our vantage point, but as was pointed out, the students and um, families as well. So I appreciate that. And we will work with um, the panelists on collecting the resources and the information shared and make that available on many, as many platforms as we can to trust the website for Amherst Neighbors and out directly to those who provide their email and name in the, the chat. So I'd appreciate all of you and those of you that came and offered questions and who are committed to making this a collective effort to solve some of the problems we have around housing in the future in Amherst. Thank you very much. Thank you and thanks for hosting. Yeah, thanks pleasure. everyone. This is recorded. I'm, I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. I'm gonna end it in a minute. So then, you know, uh, everything will go away, but uh, the chat will be saved and the video will be recorded. And like Linda said, we can uh, compile it and then, uh, and then, you know, have it on a few different platforms and media. So thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.